The first Sunday of Advent, we talked about the beggars. Last Sunday, we talked about the prisoners. And today, we have before us the dreamers. Welcome to this third Sunday of Advent. The sermonic theme for today is the dreamers, shouts of joy. For her fourth birthday, Nicole's parents decided to surprise her with a puppy. They snuck into her room early in the morning and they put the puppy in the bed with her. You could see this little furry, honey, brown puppy snuggling up to Nicole. But Nicole was still in the trenches of sleep. To stir her finally, one of her parents called out her name. Ah, she hears her name being called. Once she was awakened from sleep, it didn't take her long to recognize something was in the bed with her. As she turned her body, she finally opened her eyes. And focusing in clearer, she saw the puppy. She commented, this is the birth, best birthday ever. What registered on her face was joy. This is where we enter the biblical text read by Jen Jasmine this morning, Psalm 126, where the psalmist can be interpreted at least two ways. This psalm can be remembered with joy what God has done for God's people in the past, or anticipating with joy what God will do to restore God's people in the future. In this first interpretation, one can see a reference to the return of the exiles from Babylonia and the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem during the latter half of the 6th century BCE, which is now celebrated in Psalms as an occasion of joy, so intense to be almost like a dream. I've heard people say, oh, it's so good, I could pinch myself. It's so positive, this instant of God's restorative power, that it doesn't even feel real. It feels like a dream. Both interpretations, whether we look backwards or forward, reveal the psalm's faith in the power of God to radically change people's circumstances and the goodness of God to do it in a life-giving way. So grand was this restoration that it felt like a dream. Dreams and dreamers help us to experience joy. Dreamers are given vision after vision after vision of the way things could be. They see possibilities. They see open doors. They see hope. They see a bright future. Some would say their feet don't necessarily all the time touch the ground. They see the way things could be. It is easy for a dreamer to see what doesn't yet exist. They just believe that somehow God is going to work it out. God is going to make this thing happen. They always have hope stored up in their pantry. And we need, we need the dreamers in our midst. We need their joy. A young boy has landed the main character in a play at his high school. He glances nervously from behind the curtain into the audience as the play is about to begin. His dads are both busy and often miss events that he's involved in. They have both promised, however, that they would show up for this play. The high school auditorium is packed. He has studied the auditorium. He has studied his lines. He is ready for this moment. He has put in weeks and weeks of practice into making sure that his performance is A+. Plus. Close to the time for the play to begin, he spots his dad's. A wave of relief comes over him. They are here. They are here to see me. The play goes great and the crowd gives a standing ovation. And after the show, when the two dads come up and hug him, and say a great job. His body fills with joy. One of our members was telling me that she only watches Hallmark. She can be guaranteed with every movie, you all know it, when you watch Hallmark, every ending is going to be what? A happy ending. 
Not just a happy ending, a happy, happy ending. Now, if you want a depressing ending, you go over to Lifetime. But if you want a happy ending, stay on Hallmark. So this member says no news for her. She doesn't cut her TV on to watch news at any time of the day because the only thing being reported on the news for her is bad news. She has lived her life and she says, give me a joyful, happy ending any day. And while some may say she's living in a fairy tale land, she has learned how to guard a precious commodity, joy. Arthur Brooks says that in adulthood, many of us are forced to recalibrate our relationship with joy. As responsibilities multiply exponentially, time grows limited and challenges mount, it becomes harder for us to make time for joy, let alone remember what it felt like to experience joy. We have become so bombarded with worry and concern, we have distanced ourselves from joy. And the recent number one Netflix movie, Leave the World Behind, starring Julia Roberts, where there is no internet, no phones, no going back to normal, and you cannot trust anybody, produced in part by the Obamas, has got people talking about what message are they trying to send us. In South Dakota, there are bunkers being sold for $55,000. You have to renovate them yourself, but there are 575 bunkers in Black Hill Mountains in South Dakota that stretch over 18 miles. You can live one year in these bunkers without ever coming up to the surface. It's a plan B for if things go to hell, says the business manager of the project. And latest, have you guys heard? Mark Zuckerberg is building a $100 million underground bunker in Hawaii. Something that makes you think, what is going on? Well, I'll tell you what, we need dreams. And we need dreamers. And we need to remember, like the psalmist, what God has done for us. With all that is going wrong in our world, we need to remember what has gone right. One of my professors said, if God never does another thing for me, Charlene, God has already done enough. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. The psalmist recalls God restoring them. It is like a dream. It is joy. When they recall the ways in which God put their feet on firm ground, when God did that thing that nobody else could do but God, when they recall the ways in which God put their feet and their hearts and lifted them up, the Lord has done marvelous things for us. Another psalmist of contemporary times said, when I look back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say, that I've been blessed. Now I need to give y'all a little bit of context because it rolls differently here at United. But in some churches, when you say, when I look back over my life and I think things over and you get that last sentence out, people start shouting. Because I can truly say that I've been blessed. When I look back, when I think about it, when I think of the things that God's got me through, it's worth pausing to remember the ways in which God has showed up for us continually. Sometimes when I'm visiting an elderly person and we get stuck on memory road, I see a smile spread across their face as they recall somewhere back there in the past a beautiful moment of joy. I remember as a kid, when I was growing up, my mom and my great uncle on Saturday nights, they would go out on the porch, be a nice summer night, and they would be out there on the porch with the six pack, and they would get to talking. And I knew it was their time. I knew nobody else was invited to the party. And they would go back to days of old. No one else was invited. And I would listen to them laugh and laugh I would watch the cares of the world peel off their shoulders, and I could see the joy in their eyes, and they would stay up past my bedtime remembering the past. Recall right now just how good God has been. Recall how God has showed up for you and yours. 
Sometimes it's good to look back. Sometimes it's good to pause and just remember how good God's been to us. Joy is enhanced in community. It's one thing to cook your favorite meal for yourself, but it's another to cook a meal and have others around the table to share it with you. It's one thing to watch your favorite show, but it's another to watch it with others. It's one thing to be in a play, but it's another to have your loved ones come out and see you. It's one thing to just put up your Christmas tree, but it's another to make a whole party of it. It's one thing to stand in your truth, but it's another when your family, biological, spiritual, and intentional, says, we got your back. Our world is moving more and more towards dividing us, but we are better. We are happier. We are more joyful when we are united together in community. So we not only look to the past, but we can anticipate in the future God's restoration and God's joy. Dreams are gifts to the dreamers, but you don't have to be a dreamer to see possibility. You can make room for joy in your life right now. You can cultivate it. We're not only looking to the past, but with much anticipation, we're looking forward to the future. That's the road we're on today. I was looking at this video of um, someone that was traveling in Nigeria, and they were on this bumpy road, and they were like the road was just bumpy, and it was all this dust, and it was a dirt road. That ain't the road we own today. We're on this road of joy today, of counting our blessings, cultivating joy. One of the things I love about here at Open Breakfast, which is December 30th, which is in the future if you're around, is it's a sacrifice and it requires war. But when we come together to do Open Breakfast, there is a joy. There's a joy in working together. There's a joy in serving other people. There's a joy in sharing a meal together. There's a joy that's in the air among volunteers and patrons. We can anticipate joy in the past, but we can anticipate joy in this present moment and future. Joy is all around us, and it really needs for us to cooperate and be open. Joy is about discovering not only what you like, but expanding in it and deepening it with others. There's this large family, and every year at Christmas time, they gather together. They buy gifts for one another that they do not need. Are you in that predicament where you, you don't need another gift that you don't need? <laughs> they love shopping, but for them, Christmas has lost its joy. Yet for years, they're stuck in this thing where they end up in stores buying stuff, not knowing what really to buy for one another. But this year, someone in their family had an idea and said, hey, you know what? Our kids are grown. We are adults. Let's find a younger family. We have everything we need. We've been blessed by God immensely. And most importantly, we have each other. And so now, with a little bit of searching, the whole family is involved in shopping for two younger families. This weekend they went out and the joy of shopping had returned to them and they weren't buying for themselves. They had turned that shopping outward and not inward. And they are experiencing a deeper, more meaningful joy. In the words of Maya Angelou, we need joy like we need the air we breathe. This is our third week of Advent, reminding us to pause and wait for the more important things in life. We're in a culture that does not wait well. When we pull up at McDonald's, if they make us wait two minutes, we upset, aren't we? Because that food should have been done, come on up. It's called fast food for a reason. We're in a culture where it's harder and harder for us to wait, and yet Advent calls us to wait. Technology has made our world one of instant answer, reservation, and Amazon boxes. I don't need my phone to go no faster, but every so many months they say they have a new updating system and my phone can suddenly do more things. But Advent calls us not to better, not to more. This week, 
this month, these three weeks, leaves us waiting for what God will bring. The restoration of God's people on such a grand scale that it felt like a dream is what the theme of this psalm is today. In our waiting, though, we don't have to get antsy. We can cultivate and create space for joy. We can dream. We can keep a pen and paper beside our bed. We can remain open to visions. We can explore the deeper meaning of joy. We can serve other people. We can remember the past. We can be lifted up. We can shout for joy. And we can be surprised by joy. Amen.